Everyone. We're excited you're with us today. But just before worship begins, we'd like you to know we're here for you and your family. If there's anything we can pray about for you, or if you'd like to share a praise report with Pastor Paula, please visit our website at cityofdestiny.us to share your request or testimony under the prayer and praise tab. You can also keep up with everything going on here at the City of Destiny by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
And to receive text messages from the City of Destiny, simply text the word CITY to 75100. The service is almost ready to start, so now let's pray. Lord God, you are the maker of heaven and earth, and we are grateful that we can approach your throne of grace today in the name of Jesus, to meet with you, to hear your word, to learn your ways, and to encourage one another. Bless our pastor now as they bring the message. Holy Spirit, open our ears and our hearts to receive it. We ask this in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus. Amen. family welcome to the city of destiny we're so glad to have you be a part go ahead and, and make a trip to the city of destiny here in the popka 505 east mccormick road sometime before the year ends we love you lord father god we thank you for this day we thank you lord we know that your presence is here because we're going to praise you we're going to give you a throne to sit on father god we love you we thank you for freedom in the mighty name of jesus christ we say amen, amen. holy spirit have your way Clap your hands. Come on. Come on, team. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Survive when we pray. 
heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you sing out living looks like freedom this is what freedom feels like heaven we praise you we praise you we say this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise up in chains and then there, there came a midnight hour where there was a something arose in his cell and and it wasn't fear it wasn't complaining but it was praise and so it's praise that destroys bondages and it's praise that allows you to say I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise I gotta let it out I can't hold back worship and exalt you almighty king father like Moses wanted to see your glory this morning we do the same we ask that you would have your way in this place that you would rain down your presence upon your people we glorify you and honor you oh God we come hungry and thirsty for you oh Jesus that's our prayer this morning Seek you. 
your face come and make your throne upon our praise here in this place have your way the moment that we see we are changed show us your glory show us your glory Show us your glory. Show us your yeah. glory. Let every burning heart be holy.
change it all. You change it all, Jesus. You change it all, Jesus. You change it all, Jesus. Chains fall, fear thou here now, yeah. Lives here, hope found here now, Jesus. Sometimes we get so accustomed to coming into his presence and worshiping him. And we don't realize that our praise and our worship breaks the chains and the yokes off of the generations that are not just here, but the ones that are to come. In this moment, I want you to press in for your children's children's children, for your grandchildren and your grandchildren's grandchildren, because you are the ones that stand as a point of contact to intercede, to break chains, to remove yokes, to break the bondage, to remove the strongholds, every demonic attack and assignment of the enemy that has been attached to your children, let them be broken right now in the name of Jesus, under the presence of his great and mighty name, for God is in this building right now, everything that you have need of, press in and get it, press in and grab it. Oh, oh, oh. Chains will break and fall right now as you praise, as you praise, as you praise. Chains will fall. Feel about here now. Jesus, you change everything. so worthy, worthy of our praise. We exalt you this morning. We magnify your name. We give you all the glory, honor, and the power. Most worthy, worthy of praise, exalted above all things, my God, you are my God. Your splendor and majesty, your wonder fills everything, my God, you are my God. Holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord Almighty, seated on the throne, seated on the throne of glory. High and lifted up, your presence fills the temple when we worship you. Oh, we worship you.
sing it together. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord Almighty. Seated on the throne. Seated on the throne of glory. High and lifted up. Your presence fills the temple when we worship you.
I just feel like we can't move from this moment. He's deserving of his glory. Father, here is children. Your seed.
just open your mouth. Open your mouth, God. We worship you. We worship you in your presence. This place, God, where there's a divine exchange, where we can come in hopeless and leave hopeful, where we can come in and exchange our ashes for your beauty, God, our sorrow for your joy, who you are in our life. We exalt you. We exalt you. We exalt you in the heavens. Oh, come on, church. When praises go up, heaven comes down. Oh, come on, over a pop cut, over the over this nation, when praises go up, heaven comes down. God, we pray the glory of God. We pray the heavens to open, to open, open heaven like never before. Open heaven like never before. And we thank you because of your presence. I don't know about you, church, but I could be in worship all day because of what God has done, because of who he is. Over and over, he proves himself faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. Oh, come on. You woke up this morning. You woke up, right? There's some people that didn't make it in, 20, in 22, but you did. You're here. You're here. And you got breath in your lungs. And we got a reason to thank God for the cross and his mercies that are new every morning. And just when the enemy thought he had you, look at your neighbor and said, guess what? Say, guess what? He lost. He lost. He lost. God's got it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, praise team. Thank you for being carriers of his presence. Thank you for setting this atmosphere and living it out in your own life. It changes everything when I step into this place. There's no greater place to be but the church, the church. So I love y'all. Let's give it up for our praise team. Let's give it up. Y'all are incredible. Not only do you bring the glory, but the, the music, the sound, it's the sound with the anointing and it, it's amazing. Y'all are amazing, amen. Let's thank God for every person on Sunday that comes and helps us make everything happen here. We are so grateful as a body of believers that we are the church. You and I are the church. I am anticipating victory on every side. Victory on every side. You can be seated. Victory on every side. For you joining us online, good morning. Happy Sunday. Jesus is for you. He is with you. And I bring you good news. You have victory on all sides. I don't care what it looked like this year. I don't care how bad it seems in your business. I don't care what they're telling you in the economy. I don't really care about the inflation because I know who's God we serve serve and he is the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings and he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I know this elder that what we need for the city of destiny and for story life and for Paula White Ministries that every need we have that God has already provided it and provision is just about to manifest. It is on the other side of divine exchange and that is what worship is all about. So we greet you. We're excited that you chose this church this morning. I can tell you that there are miracles in this house. And because you showed up, because you did your part, God's about to do his part. And same with you online. Many of you are a part of our church online and you live in different states and we are standing with you. You don't do life alone, amen? Let's let them know that we pray for them, that we cover them, that we know that they're a part of this body because we don't do life alone. We do not do life alone. And we have a few key announcements. Next Sunday, December 11th, we have our very own special pastor appreciation. Let's give it up for our pastor, Pastor Paula White Kane. We are going to celebrate her. We are going to honor her. My husband has set some special things in motion. He had the vision, the heart. I don't think I should announce some stuff publicly because it's a surprise, but we want you to know that we are honoring her next Sunday. And the reason it's next Sunday is actually Pastor's Appreciation was back in October and it kept being pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, and she wasn't even gonna do it. And our staff said, let us honor you, let us celebrate you. So we are, we're gonna do what's right by God, right? We're gonna give honor where honor is due. 
And we need to show the woman of God, the, the matriarch, what she, who she is in our life. And because of the price she's paid, she's a pioneer. There's very few voices like her. And we've got to recognize it and we've got to celebrate it. Because what you don't celebrate eventually exits your life. Look at your spouse and say, celebrate me, baby. Celebrate me. Celebrate me, baby. So also a very important announcement that this is one of my favorite things in December. And we laid out all of these tickets right here because we want you to come up here and grab some tickets. These are tickets to invite everyone and anyone, everywhere you go, bring them to your work, bring them to the Publix. When you're going through getting a coffee and you're getting your, you're paying for your coffee, hand it to the people that are, you know, you're taking your money and say, hey, I got something for you. Uh, it's Christmas's love concert with our very own Jonathan Kane, and, it, and it's amazing. Every year, he worked so hard on this. He's been working on it. He writes new songs. He has some songs from his um, album from a few years ago, Unsung Noel. He brings in everybody, the band. I mean, they come in from all over, and it's not just a typical concert. I mean, the presence of God, and it fills this place, and it's a true reminder what Christmas is all about, and we all know that's Jesus and what God's done for us. And so, also, they're going to have an orchestra, special children activities. The kids, you don't want the kids to miss it because they're doing carriage rides with Bootsy. How many of y'all were here last year when we did carriage rides with Bootsy? It is one of our favorite things. So it is December 18th on Sunday at 6 p.m. Please, everybody, mark your calendar and those online, mark your calendar if you can make it, if you could fly in, be here with us, and don't forget to grab a ticket. We have all these tickets down here. I love taking these and handing them out. It's such a great opportunity to share with people to come connect to the local church because that's that's what it's all about. We are the local church. And I'm going to get right into our tithe and offering because my husband's here and he has a word from heaven. I'm going to share one verse before we get ready to give for our tithe and offering. And that verse, verse is in Matthew 6, And most of us know it, but it says, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. Not seek first your education. Not seek first everything that this world says to do. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then it says everything else will be added. It will be added. Not just given, but added. God is a God where he adds to your life. So whatever you give God, he takes that and he turns it into multiplication. So whatever is in your hand, when you release it, see, it's, it's a simple fact of, it's not legalism. It's not certain things that, oh, we have to do. No, we get to do it. We get to give to God what he's given us in our life. Whether it is your resources, which we're giving, it's your time, it's your prayers. However you can serve in the kingdom. That is what it's all about because giving, look at your neighbor and say, giving changes the world. Giving changes the world. And that's what Jesus did. God came and he gave his only son and it brought change. So whenever you're ready for change, who's ready for some change in 2023? I don't know about you, Pastor Todd, but I went through some things this year and I, I was anticipating some things and, and I was working through some things spiritually and I looked, I had some heart-to-heart -heart conversations with God on my face and fasting and prayer and I said, all right, God, I'm ready. I'm ready this year. I'm, I know that what you're about to do in 23 is what you've shown me my whole entire life. I'm ready now. There's moments where I thought I was ready, but the process that I went through, I now know that I'm ready. So I'm ready for true change. And when you get ready for true change, you have to give. You have to make that sacrifice in the spirit to create change in the natural. Amen? So that's what tithe and offering is all about. It's living according to God's principles, God's attributes, which God is a giver and he loves us. So let's stand to our feet this morning. We are giving. It is a consistent thing here that we get to seek first the kingdom. Matthew 6, 33. I could tell y'all story after story how God supernaturally provided for me. I never forget when I had one homecoming duchess at my high school and I had no way to pay for my dress. My father had passed away. He, the anniversary date is coming up. The holidays can be hard. They can be tough. We lose loved ones. We have to work through things. We can look at what we don't have instead of what we do have. But I believe we're, we're a spiritual people here that God's matured. 
Because what we have is literally life and hope to this dying, broken world. And, and I'll never forget, it, it, was, it seemed so simple, but the Lord told me to go to this boutique and pick out my dress. And I thought I was crazy, but I was like, no, I'm hearing from God. I was 17 years old, and I was like, I'm going to go pick out my dress and I'm gonna wear it the night to walk on the football field. And I had, you know, every year I actually won it at my high school, even when I left the high school. And that was only the favor of God because I was always a light for Jesus. That's the only reason why I can tell you that. But I, I picked out the dress, a couple, it was, I did it like two weeks before. Nobody, I was praying and praying. I even had mentioned to somebody, oh, I'm believing God for a dress. Nobody, nothing was happening. And I was like, all right, God. And, and it really came down to like a few hours before that event. It was the afternoon of the actual event. And I'll never forget what God did for me. Because as a girl who lost her father and started working at Paul's Pizza across the street from my high school, you know, some things can seem so overwhelming and, and, and just hard when you're a teenager. And when, when that provision part of your life is taken, God allowed that to happen in my life to develop something else. And I had no idea what it was leading me on, but it was this path that my heavenly father is my provider. And it doesn't matter what it looks like. I worked. I didn't just sit at home and say, oh, God, give me money. No, I was actively working. I was, I've been a hard worker my entire teenage years. But it was in that moment that I'll never forget the provision of God. A friend of ours called to say, ask what time we were leaving to the event. And they asked if I needed anything. They said, well, what are you wearing? And it was a family. And I said, actually, I've been believing God for my dress. I don't have it yet. And he goes, well, let's go get it. And I got my, it was about $200, which was a lot of money back then. I went and picked up my dress. I still own it today. And I call it my faith dress. Amen. So whatever it is, whether you're 16 years old and you need a faith dress, whether you're you're 40 years old and you're believing God for your business and you need that down payment for your home. I'm looking at homeowners in 23. I know we are blessed. I know that God has allowed us to have something to offer this broken world. Amen. Lift your hands. God, we commit our giving to you. We know that it is something that we can do spiritually, that we recognize Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom. God, we come to church because we have the opportunity to glorify you and release what's in our hand to honor you, to say the kingdom of God is first. The house of God is first. God, we're going to raise our children this way. We're going to see a generation generation rise up and honor the house of God. They're going to be what the light in the dark world. And it's all because of a people here right now in this moment that are being obedient unto your word. So God, we thank you for provision. We thank you for breakthrough. We thank you. God, it's so much more than finances. It's so much more than money, but God, you give us blessings that money can't buy. You allow us to have long lasting marriages. Oh, come on. I don't know about you, but Brad and I, I can't wait to see him when we're 70, 80 years old looking at our grandbabies. God, we thank you for legacy. We thank you for the gift of legacy. We thank you for the gift of children's children. We thank you for the opportunity this morning because of what you gave, we give unto you and we seal it in prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You can bring it up. Carmen, if you have the video, this has nothing to do with my message, but I just wanted to share it with you guys. Do you have the video? If not, I won't take time, but do you have the video Rachel sent you of Nick?
He's, this hand thing at the end cracks me up. Here, here he goes. He's wrapping it up. Right. <laughs> That has nothing to do with my message. I just had to share that with you guys because it made me, I mean, he went in on it, guys. He went in on it. Outside of the joy that that provided me, I just wanted to share it with you guys. So, kids are fun. All right. Thank you, baby. All right, I might sit down. Usually I always get up. I end up getting up. Um, <clears throat> when I was preaching... <laughs> When I was preaching in Ghana, I, I, my stomach got really upset, and I started, you know, I got sick. And, uh, and there was no way that I should have been able to get on stage and do it, but I didn't. It's Gideon's hilarious because he, he called, he said, hey, buddy, hey, buddy, you're not feeling good. I said, no, man, I'm, I'm having rough. So they were pulling me up, and I was just, I was going, and then I just had to get up and preach. I had to run out of the, to the restroom when they called me. Again, it was just, and he said, he, he made me preach anyways, like, you know, I know Gideon at this point, there's no out, like, there's not like a, there's not like a, you can, uh, you know, just kind of, oh, it's okay, sympathy, he says, oh, okay, buddy, get on stage, you know, you're like, and uh, they had to IV me and everything uh, after that and everything, but I, Gideon talked to him that night, he said, he said, um, it's your message, he said, it's your message, he said, you know, Paul had a thorn in his flesh that he asked God to remove, and he said, prophetically, I've prayed about this for you, and he's like, I'm not worried about you physically. He said, for a season, there's just something that you have to deal with, and when you carry something, there's times that you're just not going to feel good. It's just part of it. It's just what you carry that everything's fighting you. It's going to fight you, and you just have to keep opening your mouth. So there's days that I don't feel great, and I know today's an important message. But, you know, when you don't feel good, it can affect your delivery and everything like that. But we just have to keep opening our mouths. We just have to keep messing, pressing forward in what God called us to do. And, and, I, and as long as we do that, then God will sustain us in all the ways that we need to be sustained. Yeah. And I'm glad, that, I'm glad that I have a church that understands that because sometimes I, I, I can be sitting in a corner or quiet and it can be misread. But you guys know that I love you all. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to preach. And just sometimes... My body just uh, gives out on me a little bit, but it does what it needs to do for as long as it needs to do it. So here we go. Today, I know this message is important, and uh, I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as possible. But we have a couple pages of notes. We're going to read some scriptures, um, and we're going to have to get through the whole thing because it's important. I always like to preach uh, where I'm coming from, and the good thing about my life as a Christian is that the experiences that I have with God are unending. They're, they're, they're new, and they're always surprising to me because I, I, you think a lot of preachers you watch and stuff like that, they seem to stagnate some. I don't know if that's true. Um, I know in my life I'm constantly changing and discovering new things with the Lord, and he's constantly growing and evolving me, and I'm always having these experiences with God that are radically different than what I experienced the day before. They're radically new, and this message is kind of birthed out of an experience with God that I had when I got back from Ghana. Um, it, you know, I was I, a couple nights or two nights after I got back, I was doing something and just broke out into this night of worship by myself. It's like three in the morning, and I was just bawling. I was crying so hard in the bed when I tried to get in bed and fall asleep that like my daughter was waking up and slapping me because I was heaving. You know that heave where you're like, uh, uh, you know, it was that kind of intense emotional thing that I had with God where God was just ministering to me. And I, at first I was praying about my life and I won't go into detail about it, but um, at first it, it was kind of a rebuke. It, was, it started out as a little bit of a rebuke. Or not, not I, it was, how do you say that about God? It's not that he's stern, but he is who he is. He's, I am what I am. I am who, who I am. And when you're in my presence, anything that's not I am is going to have to be left at the door. You become very conscious of the parts of you that aren't what God is. And so it's, it's a type of rebuke without being a rebuke. God doesn't need to rebuke you. He just needs to let you in his presence. And once you're in his presence, you're, you're, you're starting to say, okay, let me get rid of this. Let me get, let me get rid of this. And, and you become very, very changed. And that's fundamentally what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this change and this process of change. 
and how the gospel frames this change and what I believe is exciting about this change. Because I believe that this change and this encounter that I have with God, it's growing me, is also going to grow you. And I think that the reason that God's going to grow you in it is because I, I believe this. I don't say this often. You don't hear me say this. I do believe that there's revival coming. Yeah. I do. Yeah. And I believe that we are, we are an important part of that revival. And um, historically, I've been starting to read and reach, research about revival. And, and I think that there's another great awakening going to happen. I, I think there is. And I wouldn't have said that even six months ago. I wouldn't have been certain of that. I would have hoped for it. I would have believed in it. I would have just carried out my calling, uh, just hoping that that would be the case. I've heard other people say it. Prophet Gideon says it. Rachel said it a couple times. My mom says it. But I didn't, I was, if I take it or leave it, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And I hope that's it. Now I'm telling you it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And that's great because it's a resurgence that I think is going to happen among young people. This real intense spiritual awakening is going to happen where, where God, and, and what's fascinating, we'll talk about this at the end, before anything significant has happened politically in this country, too, there's always been a revival. You know, before we even had our independence was the first great awakening about 30 years before. Um, uh, the second great awakening led directly to the abolition of slavery. I mean, these, these big movements that happened in our country uh, that were social in nature first had a spiritual component. So I'm very excited about what God's going to do. But let's get into it. So, so we talk about the gospel if I said to you, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Um, everybody would likely have different answers. And, and we, we would say oh, it's about the death and resurrection of Jesus or worshiping Jesus. Or, or we might just say it's good news. And you have to define that good news. And we, we might have different answers. And all those things are right. All those things are right. But they're right as components of the gospel. And a lot of times we frame the elements of the gospel that uh, we want to. You know, we frame the parts of the gospel that mean the most to us at any given time. And while there's so many possibilities to describe what the gospel is, there are some elements what the gospel is that we don't hear framed very often. We don't hear certain aspects of the gospel framed very often. And I think as a byproduct of our culture and our society, one of the things that we perceive the gospel to be and, and how we use it as, as a vehicle for empowerment and self-empowerment. And the gospel can be empowering to who you are, but it's not empowering to who you are in any way that the world would recommend or expect it to be. It's, it's actually, uh, its form of empowerment is so radically different than what the world means by empowerment that we have to be very conscious by what we mean and what we're saying when we think the gospel's meant to empower us. Uh, when we think, even when we think about how miracles are used, even when we think about what God wants to do in our life, when we think about our prayer life, all of these things have to be filtered through the right process and through the right lens first before God can empower our lives because there is a step that happens before God empowers you. There is a process that happens before God empowers you. And it's one that isn't preached nearly enough. And for some reason, God is moving me in a direction to preach on it a lot. I'm going to be preaching on it more and more and more. I'm going to be preaching about the parts of the gospel that nobody wants to hear. And I noticed that Jesus did this when he would preach. The moment he got a massive crowd, his largest crowd ever, he said, said, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, and they all just ran away. They all dispersed. And, and every time he preached, the disciples, there was a sense of frustration because right when Jesus was peaking as a preacher, he would say something that would alienate everyone. And then Jesus would say, it's for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And he already said, these are the mysteries for you, disciples, not for them. Think about that. I'm, I'm willing to preach to 5,000, but what I have to say is for you 12. What I have to say is for you 12. And the story about those 12 are all in the say. And the same except for one of them, Judas Iscariot. All 12 of them would die with the exception of John the Baptist or John the Beloved who would live the longest of the disciples. All of them would die. And, and one of them died uh, selfishly. He still died, Judas Iscariot. He just died not fulfilling his purpose. The rest of them whom Jesus preaching to, they died fulfilling their purpose. And so when he talks about the mysteries of God, he talked about something that they inherited through the laying down of the self. And it's at this point that the gospel is radically different than anything else that you encounter. Because if I had to say today what the gospel is, at least one element of the gospel 
The gospel is the giving up, the, giving up of the things we know for a promise of what we don't. And that's an interesting element of the gospel. I've never heard somebody just like, I said, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Nobody's looked at me and said, you know what it is? It's the giving up of everything you have now for the promise of something you don't even know yet. And fundamentally, that is what the gospel is. We get excited about all the things that we're going to have. We get excited about all the things that we're going to inherit. But I want to emphasize the first element of that uh, formula today, which is all the things you have to give up. (laughs) The gospel is, you know, I I was writing down different things, and I'm going to go through different verses uh, where Jesus and Peter and Paul all framed the gospel in the same way quickly. But, but I, I wrote down, I said, in a strange way, the gospel pitches itself like a, like a stranger, like a strange guy in a van asking you to get in so he can show you something great. <laughs> Seriously. You know, that, that creepy guy in a van, except he doesn't have to be creepy. A guy, imagine a guy in a van shows up and he's like, look in the back of here. Come on, come on, get in the back of this. I want to show you something. Everybody say, no, on paper, it's something that you would tell your kids to avoid. On pa- if I was looking on paper, I'd say, yeah, let's stay away from that philosophy. Let's stay away from that idea because it promises you death. You know, and so, so it's funny because we get, we preach and we act like we're all embracing of the gospel. But the reality is that there's this really strong element of it that on paper we would reject for our kids. We wouldn't recommend it for our children. We would say, no, 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 that's not, that's not for you. There's got to be other ways to be empowered because... Here's what Jesus says about the gospel in Matthew 16, 24, Mark 8, 34, and Luke 9, 23. In all the synoptics, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. That's just one one thing. He says, take up your cross and follow me. Now, we know that the cross is what he died on, but the cross is also an object of humiliation. It's an object of shame. It's an object where there is nothing redemptive outside of Christ's death that comes with the cross. And we look in retrospect as though this is an object of glory, but it's an object of ridicule. It's an object of death. It's an object that nobody would wish somebody else to pick up. So this is why I say on paper this is something we wouldn't even recommend to our kids. Because Jesus just says, pick up your cross and follow me. He doesn't even tell you where the me follows to. He doesn't tell you what the end is. He simply says... Take this object of shame, this object of ridicule, this object of poverty. Rich people, rich people don't get crucified. This object of poverty, this object of rejection and isolation. If if you love me, take this up and walk with me. And it's easy to look back in the day and say, oh yeah, that was fine 2,000 years ago. But I'm going to argue today that the message is still the same. Take up your cross and follow him. Let's look at Luke chapter 14, 25 through 33. All right. We're going to go through some scripture and we'll do it quickly today. Um, Matthew 10, 34 to 37 is the same framing. So I'm just going to read the Luke passage, but Matthew 10, 34 to 37 uh, is also the same. Luke 14, 25 to 33. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned, and he said unto them, If any man come to me, I'm going to stop. I'm going to drink my water because I want you all really to hear this. I want you all really to think about it. Do you all ever feel like in church, is it just me, or do you all ever feel like we read a bunch of scriptures without really thinking about it? You ever feel that way? Like we rush through it and we, we scream out, we shout it out, but we don't like meditate on it? That's something that I think we should really aim to do more. At least one scripture a day you should meditate on. Like really just pull aside privately and just think about it. You know, because it's one thing to preach the Bible and get excited about the Bible, proclaim the Bible and cheer the Bible, but the Bible has a lot of stuff that hurts you. It's got a lot of stuff that cuts you. It's got a lot of stuff that you should wrestle with. It's got a lot of stuff that you should ask God's questions about. It's got a lot of stuff that when you're little you shouldn't understand, that you should grow into. 
And, and you can't do any of that if you're just rushing through it or only reflecting on the things you like. You've got to take at least a little bit of it, and the great part is Jesus himself, and meditate on it daily. And as a pastor, this is my recommendation to you. Going into the new year, for the year 2023 and the rest of this year, take one verse a day, just one, if you don't do this already, and just spend your day with it and your thoughts. Just, just, just keep it with you. Tuck it away and ask God to give you insight into it. And that will change you. All right, Luke 14, 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother, not just your daddy, but your mama too, and your wife and your children and brethren and sisters. Now, now the children part, that's the one I, really? Really, Jesus? You bringing my kids into this? And brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, how many of us, just seeing a guy, Pastor Todd, if I was interested in what you had to say to me, and I was like, I might follow this guy. I kind of like where his life is going. I'm curious about it. And you said, all right, buddy, come here. I'm going to give you the secret. Come here. And I said, yes, sir. you got to hate your father, hate your kids, hate your mother, hate your brother. You have to hate your own life. Then you can follow me. All right, Pastor Todd, God bless. See you guys later. I, I don't know if what you have is worth that. I don't know everything that you carry, but I'm not sure it's worth that. I sure enough know that y'all would not follow me if that was the foundation of my advice. Take, take everything you know for something that you don't yet. You follow me. I can't even begin to tell you the conclusion of where I'm going. And when I do tell you through code in your life, in everybody's life, in the disciples' life, when I say things like, like Jonah, I'll come back out in three days or I'll resurrect again, you're still not going to understand it. You're going to think that my kingdom is for now. You're not even going to recognize that it's for later. That's not an obfuscation just for the disciples, but it happens in your life prophetically too. Follow me. Follow me, Brad. You're not going to understand the path. You're not going to understand it all. You're going to see pieces of it. As Paul said, you're going to see in part, looking through a glass darkly, but... The only thing that I'm going to make clear to you is what it's going to cost you. I don't, I'm not going to tell you where I'm going. I'm going to tell you what it's going to cost you. I need you to hate everything. I need you to hate your children. Now, I know Jesus is not telling me to go slap my kids in the face and kick them down. I think he's making clear that this life is something that will do everything it can to rob you of the promises of God. Which means that if you begin to place your children, your relationship with them, what you think the goodness is for them, above what God's plan is for their life, you're going to end up working against God. I pray for my son every day. There's things about my son. I know there's things, there's things about my daughter I know. There's things about my son I know. But there's things about my son that I do not know. And as a father, it makes me uncomfortable. I haven't seen a spouse. I, I pray, I pray. I, I know Asher gets married. I know, th I know th certain things, but I have not seen Nick's spouse. I pray for his spouse. I pray for his kids, but there's certain things that are guarded from me. There's certain things that are kept from me. And there's certain elements of his ministry that I get worried about as a dad. I, I don't want him to suffer loneliness. I don't, want to su I don't want him to suffer rejection. I certainly don't want him to put his life at risk. I don't, but I'm not God, and I have to submit myself to the plans of God for my son and trust that process more than I can trust my own plans for his life. That means I have to be able to push him away enough to say, okay, God, you got this. We, 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 we think about these things, but I can't conceive of what Abraham was going through when he puts his child on the altar with dagger in his hand. And yet he says there's a ram in the thicket. God's going to provide. My actions are saying otherwise. This process is telling me that God is nowhere to be found. What I feel and what my flesh is doing is in direct opposition to what I know about God, which there's a promise for you, and this cannot end the way the it ends for those who follow the gods of my father. Because the gods of my father, we all follow three on the knife. We all shed the blood. The gods of my father, they demand the sacrifice. But this God whom I've just discovered, first generation convert, am just now getting to know, don't even yet know his name, this God, 
This God, I know it's different. I, 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 I was hoping it'd be different back here. I was hoping it'd be different halfway up the mountain. I hope it'd be different when I laid you down. And I'm sure as heck hoping it's different right here. All right. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be to my disciple. Uh, you can't even follow me. There's something so deep here that's being said that I did not understand it until I hear, heard Gideon's sermon in, in Ghana. It was when I heard Gideon's sermon in Ghana that certain, Christ, uh, certain scriptures came to life to me, and this is one of them. He says, you cannot be my disciple unless you do this thing. Now, Jesus had a way of talking that makes, that makes it feel like maybe this is just hyperbole or, or what is exactly he's saying here? Is he being literally you can't or is he being uh, uh, metaphorical that you can't? Jesus, I think, is being literal here. I think Jesus is saying literally you cannot become my disciple unless you die. And we're going to get to that. He says that you, you cannot become my disciple because you cannot become what I am without first laying down what you are. And so we, we think that this statement is a statement of, hey, extremity, like, oh, things are going to be hard if you follow me or pick up there's difficulties. But Jesus is, is letting you know an ontological truth about his being. He's letting, you know, he's letting you know a philosophical depth that he's saying, listen, this is not just me being difficult when I tell you you can't follow me before you pick up your cross. This is me being literal with you because you don't have the power to become what I am without first laying down what you are. You don't have the power to resurrect in glory both in this next life and, and spiritually in your sanctification if you don't first crucify your flesh. You don't have the power to become anything that I am unless you first lay down and are willing to lay down everything that you are. So I'm not trying to be difficult here. I'm not trying to get in your way. I'm just telling you before you take one more step with me on my journey, before you, before you leave your fish to become fishers of men, before you do anything else, if you want to look like me, you got to die like me. It's tough stuff, too. I'm going to get to a hope, hopeful part. I'm going to get to an optimistic part. My, my brother, Josh, he's, he's, he's thinking about it now. He's about to walk out. I can tell. <laughs> I'm messing with him. And this, there's some optimistic parts. There's a hopeful part. There's a way that God does it. But first, we have to deal with this truth. All right. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it. Another way of saying this, what Jesus says here, he's saying, I'm not being hard on you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to give you a reality of what this faith is. How many of us sit with converts before, if we have a mega conference? And that's how we do it, Pastor Todd. If you are here, and this is my one chance to tell you about the gospel, and I said, all right, you got to die. You ready to die? If, if, I, if my, what I pronounced in your life was first death, how many of people would say, you know what? Thank you for being honest with me. I think I'm going to go another path. I can tell you most of the world thinks that way already. And, and Jesus was letting his disciples know, not, not his personality. not any, He was letting them know the true cost of this out of a place of compassion, saying, if there was a way that this could be easy for you, I would love to give you that way, but there's no way that this can be done. In the same way, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but through me. He's stating a, a position of fact that there is nothing you can do that is good outside of him. Everything good, no matter what religion you are, everything good that is done is participating in Christ. I don't care if you're a Hindu. When you love somebody and you act out of love, you're acting out of Christ. You don't recognize it, you don't realize it, but you cannot operate in good without operating in an element of who Jesus is. Here he's making the same statement of fact, saying you can't change the way that you need to change unless you're willing to die first. And see, so conversion for the disciples, this process, first of all, we don't have conversion the way we think of conversion now. We only have discipleship. So with the disciples, we have discipleship. Because if conversion for us was confessing with our mouths and believing in our heart that Christ raised from the dead, then what was it for the disciples who didn't see him die and didn't see him resurrect? Jesus immediately went to discipleship. 
He, and he immediately laid out the cost, and he put it here compassionately. Instead of a position of obstinance, he's saying, listen, if I was a builder, I'm not going to ask you to build something with me if you don't know how much it costs you. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold it begins to mock him, saying, this is the man who began to build and was not able to finish. That's heavy stuff. I know that there's parts of me as a Christian that fits within this verse. There's things God started in my life, but if I'm not willing to pay the cost, he's not going to finish it. I know that about me, and you're not better than me. (laughs) So I know that about you. You may be better than me. You may be better than me. But I know, as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, and I'm really serious about following Jesus, and I know there's some things that Jesus has not finished in my life that need to be finished, and I have to weigh the cost of those things. I have to weigh the cost of the scaffolding for my destiny. I have to weigh the cost of the scaffolding for my children. I I have to measure what it's going to cost me in order for God to finish what he started building in my life. This is not a heaven issue. Jesus doesn't frame things about them going to heaven. He frames things in terms of discipleship, knowing that these guys would embrace the heaven thing, would want people on seeing the resurrection, would believe it. But he, the, all the work that he dealt with with them when he was here was work of discipleship. He didn't deal with work of conversion. He dealt with, let me take what is needed to make you a follower of me. And I guarantee you that, that if Jesus got to spend a lot of time with you, as, as he is supposed to with your pastors and the people in your life, he's going to focus on making you capable of being a disciple so that he can finish what he built. I'm not worried about a lot of people going to heaven. I am worried about that in the global sense. But in the church, when I deal with people, I'm not worried about your going to heaven as much as I am worried about your ability to disciple and follow through on what God wants to build in your life. Because you are what God is going to use to get people to heaven. And so if I can fit, that's talking about the great awakenings. Uh, I was going to wait till the end, but Pastor Todd, you know this. The first great awakening was all within the church. It happened within church people. And so these people were all in church, but all of a sudden they woke up to an intimate relationship with God. And they became a pious people. The, 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 the church got set on fire. And people like Jonathan Edwards and all these great preachers, they were preaching, and all of a sudden it lit up something in the church, heart of the people. These people were coming to church. They were in church every Sunday, but, but something changed, and they called it the awakening, and I love that. And the awakening happened where they woke up to who they were in God. And all of a sudden this revolution happens in the church. And that precedes what we call the second great awakening. And these are historical movements. Uh, well, the first one happened in the 1730s and 40s. The second one happened in the early 1800s. The first great awakening precedes the second great awakening, which was an, an influx of converts outside of the church. So God first dealt with the people in the church, woke them up and said, yeah, you know, that heaven's great. You guys are going there, but you're, you're not even going to understand what you're inheriting because you're not living it here on earth. So he woke them up. And let me tell you something. One of the things I noticed in studying uh, these revivals, Pastor Todd, that, that I, I, I was raised differently as charismatic. We always taught revivals as a place of miracles. That, that miracles and healing crusades, that's what we called revival. And nowhere historically, with maybe one minor exception, was that the case. It was always prayer and preaching. Prayer and preaching. Prayer and preaching. You always had people moved by preaching and, and, and thrust by prayer begin to recognize passionately that they had a responsibility to God beyond what they were giving. They, they began to let God finish what he was constructing in their lives. And, and so for 20 years, I think in the early 2000s, and even my mom would tell you this and, and the generation of all that, like when I was growing up, uh, you know, Tawana, you, you probably experienced this. You're my age, right? Young? Are you my <laughs> I'm messing with you. Yeah, we're the same age. We're the same age, so I think I'm assuming that. Um, but anyways, when we were growing up and stuff, it was a matter of, of crusades is how uh, revival was defined. So if there was a healing crusade or something, all of a sudden we were hoping for a revival that would be initiated from a miracle, and that's not how God operates. He operates almost exclusively behind the scenes through prayer. And so you will not have a revival unless prayer is initiated in your church and is going to such a point where God responds and then empowers the preaching for people to hear. Okay? 
And so, preaching and prayer, preaching and prayer. If you want revival, you want to see your kids saved, preaching and prayer. Here we go. This is how we got, we've got to solidify prayer in our church. We've got to make it strong. And the reason that prayer has to be strong and, and fervent is because it's an indication of intimacy. And so a church that is intimate with God will, will be a church that prays. That's one of the things we've got to fix here. And we're, there's a lot of changes coming and fixing here. But, but let me tell you something where the enemy has attacked this church more than anywhere else is in the place of prayer. Every time we've had a praying pastor, every time we start to build up people, they've split off and church here, their church, there's people leave. It's been so hard to sustain prayer. And it's so hard to trust people with prayer without it becoming a place of control in people's life. My job is to empower you to pray. My, not, my job is not to control you through prayer. So be weary of people who try to control your life through prayer. You need to be empowered in prayer. Prophet shouldn't control you. Prophecy shouldn't freak you out or control you. That's not the goal. I can warn you as a prophet, but it's not my job to control you, Demetrius. It's my job to empower you and pray that you encounter God in such a way that you're... Because I can't sustain your prayer life anyway. And so if we're always like, I need so-and-so, I need so-and-so to pray, 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 pray this, pray this, they're fundamentally failing because you should be empowered to walk away and say, God's showing up in my prayer closet with me here today. And unless you people in this church get like that, we can't hope for revival even if we have the best preaching in the world. And honestly, if you want to see me preach my best, pray. Pray. You want to see Pastor Paula preach her best? Pray. Pray. That is the groundwork because God responds to intimacy. It's a one-two combination. It's, it's easy. Our faith is easy. God is a God that craves intimacy. When you give him intimacy, he responds with the miraculous. Miracles are easy thing for God. They're easy. God, God's waiting for you to show up and claim your childness to him. Unless you're like one of these, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to preach on the childlike faith. I, I want to preach on that. That's going to be one of my next messages because it fascinates me. And it's in one of those scriptures that we run away from again. I think about it every time I see somebody shush a child in church. And it's like, shut up, go, go sit down, go sit with your man. I'm like, well, this is, these are the ones. This is the example. Like, I, I want a section where kids just run around. That's, it makes me feel alive. It makes me feel alive. It, it brings life to me. Okay, that's, because that's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be emulating them. My son asking me about like Popeye and Batman and who can fight Jesus. Will Jesus win them all? Those are ridiculous questions. And so are ours. So are ours to a great and majestic God. We are meant to be ridiculous. God finds us cute. He's enamored by us. That's how we are meant to be. We're meant to be silly, not serious. Anyway, I went off a little bit. Where am I at? Okay. Did we finish this part? Luke chapter 14. You guys get it. Go to 35. Let's go. Let's see what Peter says in 1 Peter 2.21. I, I, I use different examples because I want you guys to see that it didn't just come from Jesus, but it came from all the disciples of who Christ was as well. 1 Peter 2.21. For even here unto, let me go to verse 22. For what glory is it when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Verse 21. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that ye should follow in his steps. Here's a reference to Christ's suffering and then a command for you to follow in his steps. Okay, let's look at Paul in Philippians 3, 7 to 10. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. This is one of the greatest scriptural examples of what, what to expect with Christianity and where we should be at here when he says, out the gate, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. I like Paul because he was salty, like me. He, 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 he had salty language. He, was, his tongue, he, he liked to say things like that. He liked to say, everything that you love is dung. 
It sounds pretty in the King James, but Paul was being Paul. He was being what the scholars call provincial, as they call Jesus when he refers to the woman as a dog. Jesus is being very provincial here. They were, they were working class people. They, they, had, they had funny, they, they spoke funny, they said funny, funny things, and their, their language wasn't all pretty and flowers. It was all, it was honest. And he says, I count everything I have as dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made comfortable, being made conformable unto his death, being made conformable unto his death, conformable unto his death, that I might know his sufferings, that, that he, here he's saying he recognizes what the disciples recognize in their following Christ in the flesh, what Paul follows in the spirit. This is a good thing to understand because I don't want you to think of an excuse for why this doesn't apply to you. It does apply to you. It applied to Paul who spent time with God in the spirit and was a follower of Christ in much the same way that it applied to Paul. It applied to us because we follow God in the same way. Paul is our example of a spirit-led Christian post-Jesus that is supposed to show us how we pursue God. And here he's saying, everything I have is done and, and I'm conformed to the death of Christ. And, and these are scriptures that are really, this is what he says to the church. This is what he says to new converts. This is what he says to people. This is his pitch for the gospel. This is his pitch for the gospel. In all societies, across all people, let's go to Colossians 3, 1 through 5. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. What does verse say three? Verse three say rather, for ye are dead. For ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. For ye are dead. He's writing to living people. But he's expecting them to have the knowledge of God. So when he says this, they know what he means. You are dead. I understand what Paul means by this now. I don't think I understood it for the, maybe the first 10 years of my Christian life, but I, I know what Paul means by this now. He says, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, and put to death your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry so what we like to do in church is say uh, put to death idolatry put to death adultery put to death lying and covetousness we like to focus on the particulars of what sin looks like and that's easy to do when that sin is not our own but I'm a sinner and you're a sinner and we're new creatures in Christ which I'm going to talk about but we still have to mortify our flesh in order that sin does not corrupt the work that God is doing. My sin's going to look different than yours. Ten years ago, it probably looked just like yours, if not worse. But the sin that I deal with now is different than yours. It's a different type of sin. It's a different type of mortification of the flesh. I put to death some things in the flesh, those particulars, but I held on to some others. I said, God, here's my left arm, my left foot, let me keep my right thigh. And let me, let me keep my shoulder because this shoulder makes me feel safe. Let me keep my right fist because this makes me feel secure. I can't go without my fist. I'll give, you, I'll give you three fingers and a thumb. That's what we do with God. I'll give you these parts. You can mortify these things. When Paul says, you, you put to death your flesh, and then he names examples of those things. He doesn't specify those things trying to target sinners. He's targeting sin itself and the origin of sin, which is, hey, you have to die and remind yourself that you're dead in order to resurrect with Christ, not just in the future, but in everyday life. I crucify my flesh daily. Y'all with me? All right. Thank you, baby. I need that. All right. Galatians 2.20, and I'm, I'm going to move on. I 
I am crucified with Christ. There he's, boom, right out the gate. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Again, this is these scriptures, we hear them so much, Josh, right? We've heard this all our life growing up, that it becomes something that, that's routine and, and easily to, to repeat, and, and we go through it really quickly without necessarily meditating it in the depth that he's saying. He says, I, I, I've been crucified with Christ. A statement of such extremity, when you think about the crucifixion of Christ, how could Paul possibly say that? Because he had yet to be beheaded. He had, Paul wasn't even crucified. He was likely beheaded in Rome. So how could Paul say that when he hadn't experienced the torture of what Jesus had gone through, yet he claims to share in his crucifixion? And yes, there is a, a righteousness element where we're shielded by Jesus that's eternal in nature. But there's also a, a reality element of sanctification that's taking place that Paul is saying, hey, look, this flesh that you see here, it doesn't reflect my priorities. It doesn't reflect my will. It doesn't reflect what my interests are. Those things have died and are dying daily. Those things are dying daily so that I can focus on God's priorities. Which is why even when he teaches the disciples who he's discipling how to pray, he starts talking about God's will. God's will, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which means let me be a conduit for your thoughts. The only way I can be a conduit for your thoughts and your principles and your goals in life is if I put my own down. And the only way that I can put my own down is if I have sufficient reason to. All right. Most of us are aware of the statements and concepts behind these verses, but don't experience them. Most of us think in terms of martyrdom, so find uh, exemptions for them. I'm going to read my notes here. The truth is that our framing of these verses are largely disconnected from our reality. Political and financial freedom, though blessing from God and the result of righteousness, should not be confused with spiritual freedom. Frankly... The evidence is overwhelming that they tend to replace spiritual freedom. They, being political and financial freedom, tend to replace spiritual freedom. And we tend to get the, the things confused. We think political and financial freedom are the fulfillment of spiritual freedom, but they are not. They are not. More often than not, and universally in the New Testament, spiritual freedom resulted in physical death. Universally in the New Testament, spiritual freedom resulted in physical death, again with the exception of John the Beloved who died a natural death, with the, what, that one exception. And he was boiled alive. So it's not like he got off easy, right? He was boiled alive. I, I think I would have rather got my head cut off, right? He was boiled alive. God only knows how that affected them. We tend to think like, oh, that had no effect. I guarantee you there was an enormous amount of pain associated with that, that he didn't just walk away from that clear and free, that, 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 that God trusted him with that cost so he could exact the toll on the enemy. Right? Because he loved Jesus. He was willing to give everything. But universally, spiritual freedom equated physical death. Universally, when these people found freedom in God, they found death in life. And, and Paul knew that. And Peter knew it, it was coming because Jesus told him it was coming. And, and now we're told that it's coming as well. That, that what is the case for our fathers is the case for us. Now, there's a good thing that Jesus ends up saying that what is impossible with man is possible with God. And that's a good thing we're going to get to. Because he says, how can you call me good? No man is good but God. Yet Jesus was God. So what was Jesus doing? Reframing the conversation. And, and then he ends up saying, when the disciples are distraught at all the things that a man must give up, he ends up saying, don't worry about it. It's impossible with you. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus is saying, by the time I'm done with you, by the time you're done with this encounter, these things aren't going to matter to you anyway. It's going to be easy to lay down your riches. It's going to be easy to lay down your home. It's going to be easy to lay down your life because you're going to come face to face with the gain that you have in me. And my number one concern is that most of us, though we're saved and though we're going to heaven, haven't finished counting the cost to build the house. And if we did, we wouldn't want to finish the building. I, I think that we haven't had that encounter that drives us to fundamental change. The evidence of that is the lack of revival itself. The evidence is right there. That, that is the evidence. The evidence is the, uh, the waning state of spirituality in America, that the American church has not counted the cost. I don't even think they know how to count the cost because we're so free and rich. 
Oh, let me just talk on this. I, I, I'm weary about talking about money with churches now. Like, yeah, God bless you financially. But that's so much the focus with so many people that if God gave you the money that you think you want, you would go to hell. Maybe you wouldn't go to hell, but you sure wouldn't finish the building. You sure wouldn't be in the condition that you need to be with for God to do what he wants. And the evidence of that is that your focus is too much on the wrong thing already. If you crave God to change you and mortify your flesh as much as you craved him to bless your business, you'd be in a whole different place in the first place. And see, we got to be careful with money because we have to be trusted with money. Don't get mad at me, God. You're the, you're the exception. You're the exception. You're the one that God can trust with money. Whoever you are, all of you are the exception so that you're not mad at me. You're the one that God wants to give millions of dollars to, even though it becomes an idol in everybody else's life. Even though the only time that Jesus drew the direct disconnection between him and another God was mammon, the God of money. When he says, by the way, it's harder for a rich person to enter the eye of a needle or the camel to enter the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter heaven. Think about that because self-sufficiency comes with these things. You replace God. How many rich people do you know? There's only one I know. There's one rich person I know that has been able to submit most of her will for God's. That's my mom. And I, that's, so I'm speaking from experience that I also can see how much wealth plays an adversarial role in people's life with their spirituality. I have seen every man who comes in contact with it corrupted. I've seen people fall off. I've seen, I've seen and, and it becomes a place where even my mom has to contend with because she has a deep knowledge. This is why I think God allowed her dad to die and stuff like this. I really believe these things because there was such a deep connection formed in my mom. It doesn't matter what she has or where she's at in life. She can always hear the cry of her father. She always knows who daddy is. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, she's not going to choose mammon over daddy. And so, so yeah, she can preach to you about God trusting her with wealth. But look at the process. Look at the process. Look at what it cost her. I know that maybe up until a year ago, God couldn't trust me with this, those things. He couldn't. And I'd be a liar if I got up here and said I was ready for it. I was ready for these things. I might not even be ready for it now. I'm just thinking, God, give me some money. I'm ready for it, right? That's what, God, come on, I'm ready for it. I'm preaching to all them, but give it to me, right? No, I'm joking. The reality is this, that, that the mortification of our flesh is such an important process that the things that we think we want or the things that we wish for or pray for are really things that will work against us in the process of our deliverance and fundamentally against the plan of God for our life. So you think you need millions of dollars to fulfill the plan of God in your life when you really just need a prayer life, right? And it's not sexy. Oh, it's not sexy. But if you know God, you know it's true. And if you know God, you know it's real. And you know that your love and your giving, and I'm going to talk about this disposition of giving, is fundamentally more important than anything that you have in your hands. Because what's ever in your hands, once you get to a place with God where you should be, is leaving your hands immediately. You're just tossing it everywhere. You're just giving it to everybody. Which is why God could build a church like the book of Acts, where everybody shared things in common. Who wants to do that? How many of you want to get rich so we can share things in common? That's good, because most people don't. They want it so they can go on their yacht, <laughs> right? And go away and every once in a while sign a check to the church. And then what happens is the pastors end up putting them on the front row and hearing everything they have to say because of their check signers. The whole thing gets messed up. I don't know what y'all put in my water today. I'm, I'm just getting it out. I'm getting it out. Because God is doing things in my life, and, I, and it's a good thing. So I think that in America we have this trouble with political freedom. I'm going to be done. Uh, 40 I'm, I'm going to be done soon. I, I, I just have to get to these points. We have a trouble with political and financial freedom that it works in opposition to spiritual freedom. And historically when you see people spiritually free, it's in the most destitute and highly pressured times. And that's when the gospel spreads like wildfire. Because all you have in the face of death is a hope in Christ. And you're going to die no matter what. So you, you might as well give everything to God. And when we have that, we tend to focus on, I thank God for this country and its freedoms. I thank God for its wealth. I, don't, I think poverty is terrible. I think it's a curse. I think it's from the enemy. I think the church is the solution to that. But I also understand that it does not equate to spiritual freedom. 
It doesn't equate to, to what God, it's not the fulfillment of what God's going to do in my life. Believe it or not, the highest fulfillment of what God's going to do in my life is represented through my death. And I don't mean that physically in this case because I don't want to die, but I mean it in every other way. That really, if you ask me, I love miracles, I love my children, I love the things that God has done for me, but, the, but where I see God most in my life as I get older and how he's killing me, and it is painful. It is painful. I, I, I promise you that I know, I believe I'd go to heaven, I, unless the gospel's really distorted and I've been wrong about things, I know I'm going to heaven because of my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm confident of that. But I, the other, this week I was praying, going through this experience and praying with God. I am not ready to meet God face to face. I'm not. I'm not ready to meet God face to face. I, I, I have not, I don't want to just be saved, I want to be well done. I can't look at you and tell you that I've run the race. I can't. In good conscience, I can't. I know that if I stood before God, you know how I know that? Because I stood, God granted me the privilege to stand before him in my bathroom. This is what a life of intercession does for you. I met him face to face now, right? And metaphorically, I didn't see God face to face. You know what I mean by that. I, I encountered his presence now so that he can work on things before I encountered it later, right? And by encountering his presence now, and I'm gonna get to the end point here for just a second, I put it like this, revelation turns into a revolution, okay? Revelation turns into a revolution. The, when God reveals himself to you, revelation to you, it's supposed to revolutionize things in your life. And see, when you have intimacy with God, he reveals himself to you now because you're going to meet him face to face. You are going to meet God. And I'm not just saying, God's not going to just hold you to account for all the sins that you can say, did you do this? Did you do the checklist sins? And you make it in the gates. No, God's going to say, how much of what I gave you did you give out for this gospel. Really, the one checklist, the standard, is how much of this did you kill? How, how much did you submit to the work of the Holy Spirit? God doesn't need you to be rich to be a revolutionary. God doesn't need you to be a preacher to be a revolutionary. God needs you. All he needs is for you to kill this. And everything that God wants to do in the earth can be done through you. All right. I'm almost done. When we talk about picking up our cross or laying down our lives, we tend to reference the possible outcome of faith in a different circumstance. Yeah, we got all that, Brad. This is not gospel. The gospel is clear. The gospel is definitive. An encounter with God has universal, unchanging results for the one who embraces it. Their death, then their resurrection. That's made evidence for the sake of time. I won't go through them, but please read these. Romans 6.6. 6, these are all Paul's writings. Galatians 2.20. Colossians 2.20. 2 Timothy 2.11, all explicitly state our death with Christ. They're explicit with it, which means that this is a universal principle that we as Christians must inherit and wake up to every day. As much as you believe that God is going to deliver the outcome for your life and you have hope for it, that he's going to do great things with you, Demetrius, and all this, you must also wake up every day and recognize that you're dead with Christ. Now, this is the part as a human that works against our faith because that flesh says, wait a minute, I'm not dead with anybody. I'm clinging to life as best I can. But it's a universal principle of Christianity that we're supposed to wake up every day and recognize our death with Christ, which is why Paul said, I crucify my flesh when? It's not monthly, it's not yearly, it's daily. Daily. That, that this is something that as much as we believe that God's going to give us great things, and because we, we, we all have hopes. And again, mom and I preach the same message. The same way, at I, I first I was like, oh, I think she watched me in Africa, maybe. But no, the notes, it's true. We preach the same thing, that there's a distinction between hope and faith. That what we think we have as faith is really hope. Because we're hoping, you see, I preached it from 1 Corinthians 13, that these things remain, right? That the things that remain are hope, faith, and love. Why does hope remain? That there's always a better outcome in, in God, and that that remains even into eternity. But I, I, I talked about how most Christians think that they're operating in faith, which is relational, and faith is costly, and faith is put in costly terms in the Bible. Faith produces great outcomes, but it's mostly framed as a way to die and then gain. It's mostly this process where you first got to, the, the first become last and the last become first. Hope is what we confuse faith for because we have hope that God will change the circumstances. We have hope that God will bless our business. We have hope that God will, that God will heal us. Those are hopeful things. Faith is knowing that God is and whatever he's going to do is going to happen in our life. And I'm going to use it. I, 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 so so we, if we encounter 
God of faith, faith is what revolutionizes circumstances. It creates the context of knowing who God is. And the reason those people that were healed had faith, and the reason their faith was referenced is because they weren't Jews. That's important to know, which means God was shocked that he, they could recognize him outside of the context of the people of Israel. That's a relational statement, Pastor Todd. That's a statement of recognition. You recognize who I am. I've not seen a greater faith. I've not seen a greater faith than this. How do you, centurion, how do you, Syrophoenician woman, how do you people know who I am when I'm not even called to preach to you? All these things I'm saying to the people of Israel, and you somehow have perceived who I am better. That's a relational statement. And what does God do? He's moved to compassion, so he heals. So he heals. But the hope is in the healing. The faith is in who he is. And so what faith does is it begins to radically alter your life in such a way that it empowers you to crucify your flesh. Faith, it, this thing that we wake up to, that we die with Christ daily, this death of self gives meaning to all the, the scriptures we tend to neglect in the other context that we tend to consider simply for the persecuted church, but is meaningful to us. The death of self also gives meaning to the gospel. It's what frames and answers the question, what is the gospel? The gospel is the choosing of death now for the life to come. And we like to get to the life to come part, but I have to emphasize the death part. That God is asking you to, and I, he says it, Jesus said it, to lay down everything you have in order to gain everything. The nice thing, he says, you'll gain houses and family and all the stuff in this life. He says, and the next. Okay, there's hope there. I'm not saying that you're, you're taking a vow of poverty. I'm saying that you have to be willing to take that vow of poverty if that's what God wants. I'm saying you have to, that you cannot look for a universal outcome of blessing in somebody's life and apply it to the church as a whole. That you have to know your context that you're in and what God wants out of you. And that's the most important thing is knowing your context and what God wants out of you so that you have to be willing to lay it down, lay everything down to gain something. And that laying of things down is painful, but I'm here to encourage you in it. It's worth it. That laying of things down is absolutely worth it. And the problem is that we don't really want to lay things down. We want to hope for a different outcome without laying anything down in our life. And so what we're doing is we're leaving in churches a bunch of unfinished buildings. It's a bunch of unfinished buildings. We're, leaving, we're just leaving structures. Yeah, everybody's going to heaven. We are. We confess Jesus. We believe in our heart. That's awesome. It cannot stop there. Jesus didn't seek converts when he came. He sought what, Pastor Todd? Disciples. He spent his time discipling. They didn't even have a framework for conversion. It was pre-Pauline. They didn't have a framework for conversion. So he was most interested in raising disciples. So if he was most interested in raising disciples, when he sent these disciples out and told them to make what, he was most interested in what? Making new disciples. And what's how did he frame things with disciples? Okay, let me just be honest with you, Demetrius. Here's how this goes. I baited you in with eternal life. That's awesome. But now you've got to die. All right, you got to die in order to get everything that God wants you to have in life, which means that you have to be ruthlessly analytical and spiritual about your life and wake up every day and say, what, what part of me needs to die today? More so, that part of you that needs to die today, here's what Jesus says. This, this is crazy because Jesus was a wild dude, man. He's wild. He's so much is that emphasis that he says, if your right hand causes you to sin and your right eye causes you to sin, Cut it off. Rip it out. I wouldn't have followed the guy. I simply wouldn't have followed the guy. Thank God he revealed himself to me in a context that I could follow because the idea that what he thinks about my flesh is so important that it's worth gouging my eye out, ripping, we kind of go, oh, Jesus was being hyperbolic there, that he was serious. He was saying that when you're following me, it is better for you to maim yourself than it is to, to carry a fence before God. That, that means, he, he gives you an example. That means if your right eye, if you, when you identify the source of sin, when you identify the source of offense before God, I expect you to be in a place where you dedicate your life to removing it. He doesn't say after you're planting, after you're sowing and harvesting, after you're burying your father, after you've done all these things, consider putting an eye patch on and tying your arm behind. He says, no, no, stop what you're doing, rip your eye out and cut off your hand. Now, please don't rip your eye off or cut out your hand. 
Please, please do not. <laughs> that's the last thing I want to deal with next time I come. But the reality is that Jesus is saying that in me, the flesh dies. And if it's not dying, there's a problem. And if you're encountering an area where the flesh is rising up against your discipleship in me, then I fully expect you to stop everything else you're doing in life and deal with that. Deal with that. And there's things in my life that I can't move forward until I deal with it. There's certain things in my life that I just, I have to deal with it. Y'all are thinking about what's your sins, Brad. That's none of your business. Because you're not going to recognize them anyway. It's my flesh. It's my, it's my negative expectations. It's my ungratefulness. It's my anger. It's things that God is not done killing. And I can't think simply because I'm in a position where I'm fulfilling purpose that he's done building the building. Because the gifts and callings, what, come without repentance. I could preach the rest of my days, and this is where God hit me. That just because I'm preaching doesn't mean that I'm finishing what he started. He, gave, he, he, gave, he called me to preach, and I'm opening my mouth. But that does not mean that I'm doing everything that's necessary to put this flesh to rest and to do what God finished. And thank God I have a God that loves me enough to show up and show me where I got to kill some things, where I got to cut off some things, where I got to maim some things. What does this death look like? Romans 7, 15 to 20. Let me just read that because that's an important passage of scripture. Are y'all with me? Did I lose y'all today? You promise? All right. For that which I, this is Paul. I love Paul. Because a lot of preachers won't say this. For that which I do allow not, for that what I would do that I do not, but what I hate that I do. All right. For that which I do I allow not. For what I would that, that do I not. But what I hate that do I. For then, if then I do that which I would not, I consent to, to the law that is good. Now, now then it is no more that... I, I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul says here, listen man, when you're operating out of the place of the flesh, you're operating out of place of sin. Which is interesting because we see this with Peter in the path to Jerusalem where Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, right? When Peter's recommending directions, <laughs> he's recommending directions, JR. It'd be like if you said, hey, Brad, take this path to root uh, home after church. And I said, get, up, get behind me, Satan, for recommending that new direction. Get behind me, ways, right? It's, it's ridiculous. And Peter was being totally honest and sincere in what he was saying. But he was thinking not hearing. He was thinking, he was, he was analyzing, he wasn't receiving. And Jesus says, man, if you were received, if you understood what I'm supposed to do, you'd know exactly where I need to be. Which means that what we frame as sin and Satan is not just all the people who are committing adultery, but all the flesh that rises up against what God wants to do today in our life. All right. Galatians 5, 16 and, 16 and 17. Almost done. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that we would. All right, so here we have this idea now that that, that, what the gospel's talking about when it's talking about death doesn't mean martyrdom for us, fine. It doesn't mean political persecution for us, fine. But it does mean the death of the flesh, which remains consistent in everything. Which means that we have a job that is somewhat harder in a way, in a strange, almost perverse way, the job of the modern Christian in our lives, Josh, Rachel, that job is so much harder than it was to just face the ax. Because we have to recognize, with the help of the Spirit of God, areas that society encourages. See, see our world builds our flesh. 
We don't think it builds our flesh, but it's constantly building our flesh. And we have a job to be able to hear things outside of that space, hear things outside of the space of empowerment, hear things outside of the space of you're an overcomer, hear things outside of the space of you, you're doing good because you're wealthy, hear things outside of the space of just work hard and you'll have everything you want, hear things outside of that space to say, wait a minute, God, I know that this society, that this world is going to lie to me in conjunction with my flesh. And if I don't have the ability to hear you, I'm going to miss areas of my life that you're trying to cut away some things. And it's amazing to me how much stuff we're willing to take into our walk. I know it's not just me because I know Christians and every single Christian I know has an area of blindness where we've just lived with God's blessing enough live with God's calling enough, live with God's uh, revealing who he is to us, live with our giftings that he's given us, and we figure that we can leave this chunk of flesh without any consequences. Every single person I know, every single person I know, there's areas of our life where we need to step back and say, this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. And the work is not complete until you do it. And it's not complete when you do it. Because the moment you think you've plastic surgeried yourself, Holy Spirit says, look at this back fat right here. We talk about new creature concepts and we misread what that means in the gospel. It's like, when, when I, I told Rachel, I said, when I became a new creature, uh, my taste changed. They really changed. They went from beer to whiskey. So, I, because I expected me to not want alcohol, right? And that's not how it worked. I got saved. I still smoke. I still drank. I still fought. Still did all the checklist of naughty sailor boy stuff. You know, I wasn't a sailor. You know what I'm saying. I did the checklist of things. And, and you, you, we think that, and I've heard wonderful miracles of people who, when they got saved, immediately gave up stuff and never picked it up again and all this stuff. But I, I've seen as a pastor more testimonies where people have an expectation that they don't really have to deal with the flesh and God will miraculously change things, but it's a process that he's going to take you through that sometimes takes a decade, two decades, the rest of your life. And this is the thing, is we give up on it. We give up on the work. We give up on the work. How many people leave because they think they're not good enough for church? They think that their sin is an obstacle to God. It's not. Your sin is not an obstacle to God if you're willing to submit it and lay it at the altar. And I don't mean you have to do anything. I mean constantly submit yourself to his revelation. Watch God do work. But how many people of us say, this is an obstacle to my life? This is an... And the thing is, if you have to, here's one thing I'm going to tell you as a preacher that, that I don't hear any other preachers tell you. I would rather you spend your entire life in the same spot fighting the same thing to get it subject to the spirit than to do all the great things that we promise you in life. And I would rather you stay in one location, the same job, the same position, the same place, and endlessly wrestle with this thing until it's, until it's submitted. I want you to give yourself to God in such a way that you say, I'm not moving until this right eye doesn't cause me to sin. And if it continues to cause me to sin, I'm going to rip it out. That's my demand for you as a pastor. Don't move forward. Don't cover your sins. Don't, 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 don't clothe them in nice garments. Don't put on the garbs of the minister and keep this cancer somewhere. Don't, don't do it. If you, you pre, go ahead and preach, but let everybody know you're working on cutting this part out. Go ahead and do what you got to do. Go ahead and move business. But the moment, the moment that God's blessing covers his work, in your life, you're in trouble. You might not even realize you're in trouble, but to me, an incomplete work is a troubled work. An incomplete work is a troubled work. God doesn't build shoddy things. So don't be shoddy. I, the only way we're going to get to revival is if we submit ourselves to the altar and, and watch as God cuts away all the things that's preventing it from happening. Let me, I'm almost done. I really am. So, so the, re, the reality is, what's the outcome of this conflict? And so what I mean by that is when you talk about the death of Christ and you're dying with Christ, you're really talking about this mortification of the flesh, and that's something that we should be obsessed with. We should be obsessed with it. 
We should be obsessed with the mortification of the flesh because it's tied into hearing the voice of the Spirit. And we should be obsessed with hearing the voice of the Spirit because as Paul says, the flesh and the Spirit work against each other. So our daily obsession with God should be an obsession of hearing the Spirit of God, which takes me back to where? You can't mortify the flesh if you don't what? Pray. You can't mortify the flesh without digging in God's Word. You can't do it because, because the Holy Spirit has to show you the areas that he wants to work out of you. And so your obsession with God should result in an obsession of, of God removing the things from your heart, the bitterness, the unforgiveness. That's so deep you can't even recognize it until he shines a magnifying glass on it. All those things in your life that you've just accepted because lay sera, sera, that's how life is. And God's dealt with it and he's covered for it and he's blessed you despite of it. That doesn't mean he accepts it. And so, my, my hope for you is to be obsessed, obsessed. And what's interesting about this is it has a specific outcome. This, this death that we share in Christ, which should become an obsession for the church. It needs to become another thing that accompanied a lot of these revivals, Pastor Todd, was holiness movements. And it's, I'm not old school Pentecostal, you know, I was raised around other people, and I'm not like a turn or burn preacher, I'm not that guy, I'm not that guy, but there is something to people, people, when you recognize God, you also recognize that your righteousness is as filthy rags, and even though it's not a debtor's gospel, you don't have to pay God back, you want to give him everything. Does that make sense? And so their accompanying revival is this intense, intense desire for people to be all that God wants them to be. And you don't have revival without it. And we shouldn't move forward in church beyond that point if we're not building upon that foundation. Meaning this, that if the church hasn't died, I'm not just going to preach all the ways God's going to resurrect their life. Because that's the promised first step. The promised first step is the death. Crucify your flesh daily. Be crucified with Christ. In other words, be obsessed with the mortification of your flesh. It's not about making a checklist of sins, but know who you are in light of who God called you to be and work in that light. And the outcome of this is universal. It's the same outcome for everybody, and this is what I'm realizing. The outcome of this is the victory of love because God is love. And when God... When God is working on you, I've noticed this. I've noticed it with myself. I'm changing, guys. I'm a different person today than I was yesterday. This is what I love about the gospel. I'm a different person. I'm a different person. I can say to you, I'm a different man than when I started. I, and I like who God is making me. I like it. I like it because I recognize that there's, there's things he needs to get rid of. And the result of getting rid of those things is love. It's love. And love changes my desire. Love changes my will. Love changes how I think about things. Love makes me understand when Jesus says, unless you're like one of these, don't come to me. It makes you innocent. It restores your childlike mind. Love all of a sudden shifts your priorities to where you recognize most of our day is spent being busy without love. Most of our days just spent moving forward. Most of the time we wake up every day and say, how can I better myself today? Which is the wrong question. It's how can I give of myself today? Yeah. What can I give today? What do I have to give? What, what God have you given me to give? That's what the revolution is. The revelation becomes a revolution of love. It's the victory of love. And then I said this, and I know for the sake of time, and if you look everywhere love is victorious in the Bible, there's nothing like it in the history of religion. The New Testament gospel, is in, it's intensely about love, so much that it says God is love. After God has revealed everything about himself, he reveals himself to be love, so much so that Jesus has no greater love as this than that man lay down his life for his brother, which means... If that's the greatest example of love and God is love, then the greatest example of God is for you to give everything to another. And so when this flesh is mortified, you give everything you are to others and therefore God, the victory is love. God, love remains. God is love. These statements, God so loved the world. He loved the world. This, this is who our God is. And so the mortification of the flesh, the process, the thing that, that becomes victorious is the victory of love in your life, which means all of a sudden you start to reframe things. When you get intensely in tune with who God is and his love, all of a sudden you start to love other people. I went through processes as a Christian. It was interesting, the processes that I went through. When I first got saved, what's up, baby? She's telling me to finish up. All right, I'm finishing up. When we first got saved, I, I cared about people, but I didn't understand God. I loved people, but I didn't understand God, and I was kind of, 
And then I realized as I got further into my walk with God, it shifted to where people, I shifted away from people and moved to God, right? Because, you know, I was like, God, I thought, how could you make us? Why, why did you, you should destroy us. We're awful. That's what I started to think. I'm like, man, you're, I wouldn't have dealt with this either. I regret making me too. That's what I started thinking. And then it shifted back to become in unison where there wasn't a distinction between the two. I, I couldn't love God without loving people and I could not love people without loving God. And now I cannot see a separate of the two. Let me tell you something. If you're a person that cares about rights, if you're a person that cares about progress, if it, there's only one thing that can secure those things and that's a love revolution that comes with the gospel. Because you can't look into the eyes of another and think yourself better than them. You can't look into the eyes of another and not be moved with compassion. It's like you can't look at a kid running around and not realize that that, that is the most beautiful thing in the world. I can't look at Pastor Todd and not absolutely want to, to, to just give him everything that God has given me so that he can have a share of the taste of that what God's done in my life. It's transformed me. So what does that mean? That means that the things that inhibit that love, the sins that get in the way with it, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with putting to death. I, those things gotta go. My tongue can't get in the way of the love. My mind can't get in the way. My money can't get in the way of the love. And so what's happening is all of a sudden I'm starting to shift as I get older and older. I, I don't realize all the things that I don't have. I don't I, I'm starting to wake up, and not every day, but it's become a rule to me. I'm waking up and saying, what, what do I have to give today? What do I have to give in my marriage today? You know how many times I fail God in my marriage? I don't cheat on my spouse. That's not what I mean. Thank by the grace of God. But you know how many times I wake up and just I'm ungrateful for her? This thing that's eternal in nature, this thing that God given me, the thing because of marital frustrations, I wake up and I, I, I rob what God called me to give her. I'm supposed to give her a kind ear, a soft response, every warmth of my heart that God has given me, and what, because I'm frustrated? You know how many times we fail our kids? Imagine how we are. If we fail within our four walls, how much more are we failing the people that we don't know yet that God gave us to get to? I guess what I'm saying is that with this victory of love and this I'm done is, is the resolve to give everything unto death. Because if God is love, then the highest expression of him is sacrifice. No greater love than this than to give your life for your brother. Then if I'm operating in God, then the end point for me, elder, is not achievement. It's not the miraculous even. It's not wholeness. It's what you just said. It's the giving of everything. Yeah. It's giving everything, which means that the high watermark of God's, God's love in my life and God's fulfillment of his promise in my life and God's finishing the building, the, the high point, the watermark of that is me losing everything. Yeah. Not losing because it was taken, as Jesus said. You can't take my life. I could call a legion of angels right now. He says, I lay it down freely. But, but it's me going, you know it's a great metaphor for it? And I'm done. I'm done. Rachel, do you want to come up? Um, great metaphor for it. How many of you have seen Schindler's List? A lot of people haven't. Y'all should watch that movie. It's a great film. It's a Steven Spielberg film, I think, of 1993, Schindler's List. And it's based on a true story of Oscar Schindler. And he uh, is a German who uh, runs a factory. It's kind of hard to spoil because it's a historical story. But he runs a factory, and he starts bringing in Jews to work at his factory to prevent them from being committed to concentration camps. And he saves all these people. He saves all these people by working in his factory. But there's this one, one beautiful scene at the end that resonates with me. And I think this is how Christians should be. He says, he's looking around and they're all thanking him. They're thanking him for saving their lives. And all of a sudden, he starts seeing things that he could have traded for one more. He starts seeing things. And he looks down at his ring and breaks down and starts to cry. And he said, he takes it off and he says, one more. That's gonna make me cry. <laughs> it's a good movie. One more. I could have saved one more. Just why, this ring, I could, have, I could have saved one more. And I think of that, that's the gospel. You wanna look at a gospel message right there. It doesn't end when God has given us everything. It ends when we lay everything down. Because we say one more. One more person in prayer. One more response in love. One more time preaching when I didn't feel like preaching. One more place I didn't want to travel to. One more act of kindness. One more dollar I could have given. One more anything to save somebody who needs the love of God and I'm the only person in this life who can offer it. One more. That's what your life gets like. 
that's where you get to a point where you say, God, let, let, let me get to a place where I, I've given it all. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I've run the race. There wasn't one more thing I could do. God, take it all. Because this world so desperately needs to know he's real. They need to know he loves them. They need to know he's ready to save them and wrap his arms around them. They need to know. And how can they know without you? You are a preacher. You carry it in you. Don't let your attitude get in the way of God's work in another person's life. Don't let your fear of financial insecurity get in the way of God's work. Don't let anything get in the way of that one more. God will spend every ounce of you. And you'll love it because you love him, even as it hurts, even as it's uncomfortable. Don't ever rest halfway up God's building before he's done and say, I think this suffices. I think I'm good enough here, God. God, if God is letting you breathe, it's because he wants more from you. You know why he wants more from you? Not as a, some propitiatory, mean God, Minister Greg, but because the Bible says that he loves this world to the extent that he desires that what all be saved and come to a knowledge of him. They're not going to come to a knowledge of him if they don't have the right knowledge of you. Lost people lead lost people. Darkness is in darkness. The blind lead the blind. Unless you say, God, what is in me today that I can show you? What can I pour out? What can I leave at the altar? What can I give? What can I get rid of? And what can I give to others? God, this thing is vital. This is not a joke. This is eternal. And it's easy to take it lightly. But this thing is not a joke. Without you proclaiming and showing and displaying the love of God, people will die without a knowledge of him. I don't know who you are. Every single one of you that are here are so important to the plan of God. You're so vital to what he wants to do. You are the key to another person's saving knowledge of him. You are a mansion. In my father's house there are many mansions. Well, you're looking at it. You're that mansion. You're it. You're the complete house that God wants to build. Let me just say, yeah, that's it. I'm done. Uh, let me just say, this is the key to our, our revival. This is it. When we get to that point where love is what matters more than anything, and that comes through this process of crucifying the flesh, and we wake up every day not, not aware of what we lack. You have more than you need to do what God wants you to do. Everything that you need, you have to do what God wants you to do. You don't realize how important a word of kindness is. You don't realize how important your prayer life is. You don't realize how important taking that extra second to, to, to let that car in front of you is. That sounds ridiculous. That's God. That's God. Those things operating in your life, you're, you, what God can do through you and what he wants to do through you, if you give him everything, is unlike anything you've ever seen history or in life, God will transform you and you'll know the full extent of that transformation in heaven. So, so be that person. Let love win. I don't want to miss this moment. Please stay right here, Pastor Brad. If you will stand to your feet. Huh? Okay, because I, I, I want you to pray over for revival. I don't, want, I don't want to miss this moment because this was not our typical word. This is an open heaven. It's, it's a call from our Father's heart. And so I want to take this opportunity I know it's past our time. The kids are ready to go, but we have to respond. So I want you who are responding to give everything out, I want you to come to the altar, and I'm going to have Brad pray for revival, and then I have an announcement, and that's it. I want us to just respond by an act of coming to the altar because this is a moment that this word, the, the word, it cuts on us. It cuts on us, and the presence of God and what he has just delivered out of his spirit God, we thank you. We thank you for this mighty man of God that's walking out this process. And babe, would you just go ahead as people are coming to the altar, would you begin to start to pray for revival? And then that's it. Then we're going to be done. God, I thank you that faith always comes with an action, God. It's always an expression of our absolute trust in you. And God, to an outsider, to an unbeliever, walking to an aisle would be no different than not walking to an aisle. Lifting their hands, committing, saying a prayer is no different than not doing it. But God, to you, it's an act of altar building. It's an act of covenant. It marks a moment in time where nothing can be the same afterwards, God. 
And it is these moments of revelation that produce revolution. And God, let the revelation of your love, who you are, what you demand of us in love, God, let that revelation be a revolution in our life. Let it transform everything about us, God. And let this moment that he had come down here, God, let this be the moment that you did a complete work in their life. God, they don't have to, to figure it out. They have to submit to these moments, God. And now, God, I ask the way you did it with me, God, I was in a bathtub, not expecting anything. All of a sudden, I, I, I broke into a four-hour worship service. God, do that with them. Do that to them, God, where all of a sudden you peel back the curtain and reveal so much of what you have in store for them, God. God, peel it back, God, to where they see the ugly things that you're willing to operate on. God, let now be that moment of operation. God, let them see the depths of things in their heart, the heart which can be so deceptive, God. Do surgery on it, God. Remove those things that hinder our destiny. Remove those, those things that prevent the house from being built, God. Let now be that moment, Lord. God, let there be a new understanding of your word. Let their, their studies be new, God. God, let their prayer life be new. God, there's nothing that man can do, God, but this moment, God, which you've afforded in eternity, God, transforms everything. So whatever it is that needs to be done in their life, I thank you, God, that it's done even now. And in heavenly places it is written. Now let it manifest here on earth and in the natural. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. And we thank you for the opportunity to do the same. Amen. 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 This presence is so strong. Amen. Thank you for that word. Thank you for your obedience, Brad. We love you so much. Can we show him how much we love him? We're so grateful for his obedience and walking out the purpose and destiny of his life. We have one announcement. Do you want to say something? Let me just say two things. Try to focus on a scripture every day. Meditate on it. That's how God will transform you. And also, wake up. Just try this. Just wake up every day and say, what am I to give today? Not what am I to gain today? How can I get saved? How can I make Just what, God, what am I to give today? Watch the opportunities he gives you to transform lives, folks. Yeah. Every day, what am I to give today? That's it. Yeah. That's so good. All right. So good. Amen. Amen. And what a more perfect season in the Christmas time to give. It's more blessed to give than receive, that we give of ourselves. One more. That stuff that came out of his spirit, I'm, I'm going to go back and rewatch, and I'm posting on my Instagram because everybody needs to hear this message, the message of the gospel. Well, we have an opportunity to give and to put it in motion, and so I want you to know right now as you are exiting, we have a way for you to be a Christmas toy sponsor. So if you want to put a smile on a little boy or little girl's face and you are able to give a toy or you can give something and sacrifice, we, want, we need you. We need your help. So right in the back, there's a way for you to become a sponsor, but if you're on the other end of this and you've just been in a difficult moment this season and you're not able to even afford Christmas, guess what? We want to help you have a Merry Christmas. Amen. We want to be on the other end of that where if you are in need or you know of a family that is in need, please go sign them up and say, you know, this family could really use Christmas gifts or I, my own family could really use it without the help of assistance. They're not going to have much. And that's what we're here for as the body of Christ to be a blessing. You know, I'll never forget I'll never forget when my dad passed away December 7th. And it was a community that pulled together to bring us Christmas and food. It made all the difference on a horrible time, in a horrible time in our life. It made all the difference. So let's, let's sign up. Let's respond to the call. And we are asking that everything, if you're going to be a sponsor, is brought and given here by December 18th by our Christmas concert for Christmas is Love. Amen. And don't forget your Christmas tickets. I'm going to grab these right now because I have a few errands to run, and I'm about to give them out myself. Lift up your hand and say, I am blessed and victorious in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you, and we'll see you this Wednesday here at the church. Good morning, City of Destiny family. It's a beautiful day to worship our Lord. If this is your first time visiting us today, then welcome home. It's the most wonderful time of the year and my favorite. 
Christmas, when we celebrate the birth of Christ our Savior. And we have a lot of celebrations planned. So listen up and get ready to mark your calendar. Starting with tomorrow. It's our next mobile food drop, December the 5th, right here at the City of Destiny Gym from 1 to 4. Also Monday, December the 19th. We'll fill cars for those in need with all kinds of delicious, nutritious food and goodies. Enough for a family of four for an entire week. Our food ministry is a huge blessing in our community and it takes many volunteers just like you. We need your help from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. or any time in between. Text volunteer or pantry to 75-100. A fantastic way to start this giving season. Find out more at cityofdestiny.us. Now the fun stuff, Christmas. Minister Jonathan Kane's annual Christmas concert will be Sunday night, December the 18th at 6 p.m. It's always spectacular and free. Featuring Minister John, an orchestra, amazing guitarists and special soloists, activities for the kids, carriage rides with Bootsy the Horse, giveaways and more. You don't want to miss this evening of beautiful music and family fun. Details at thecityofdestiny.us. It was an amazing concert last year, so I can't wait for this one. And that brings us to the next Saturday night, which is Christmas Eve. Our beautiful candlelight Christmas Eve service begins at 6 p.m. on December the 24th. Come celebrate Christ our Savior's birth with your City of Destiny family. Then Christmas Day is on Sunday this year and we'll be right here Christmas morning for a special Sunday service at 10 a.m. Details on all Christmas events at cityofdestiny.us, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Stay tuned for more info on Pastor Appreciation coming up on December 11th. And one more for your calendars. Make plans to ring in the new year together right here at the City of Destiny with your church family. New Year's Eve service is Saturday night, December the 31st from 10 p.m. until midnight. Come start the new year off right, right here in God's house. It's going to be a busy month around here for sure. Keep track of all of it at cityofdestiny.us, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Have a wonderful and blessed week, everybody. Merry Christmas. We enjoyed your presence today, and we trust you received a blessing. Please join us again. We're here every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time and every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And we'll see you on social media. Please like, subscribe, and share the City of Destiny Church on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time, be well and be blessed.